and I'm sure it's not uh, exactly the words he had, but he said, in 10 years' time, I want at least 20 CEOs to coming from PES college. Right? When you have a vision like that, even for the teaching staff and for the academy, it is very, very easy to follow that in a direction which will take you to success. Whereas if you're, if you're in the mode of, hey, you know, the next batch has come, it takes us another four years, let's get them through together, right? That is a very, very mundane, you know, non-innovative level of activity at the academics. What you need to be looking at is that each one of these guys is, is a CEO in himself. And if you can make that happen through those four years, then you have successes. Right? You can see that if, if, when you can have a CEO sitting in ninth standard, you can obviously have CEOs sitting in a BE college. Right? So that is the way I think the, industry, sorry, the academy needs to change to make sure that they are positioning each one of the students as great CEOs of this, com uh, of this uh, country. Right? So once those two things come together, so let me going back a little bit, uh, the two things I mentioned was that students have to make this a success. So you have to make sure that the money is going in the right place. And academy, on the other side, has to make sure that, uh, academia has to make sure that you know, the, the, each student is treated like a CEO or a CEO to be, and hence trained in that particular fashion where he learns how to do innovation, learns how to uh, treat people other properly. Uh, there are lots of things. Uh, and, uh, and just going back on that, uh, I just remembered, one of the things I typically tell my people uh, very, very regularly in my team is the fact that you could be anybody when you come into the company. But when you are the CEO, the only thing that you have carried is not your Java C++. It's not your ability to do design. It is your ability to treat people correctly. Learn that. If you learn how to treat your people correctly, whether it's a team, whether it's your boss, whether it's your juniors, whether it's your customers, that will take you to be a CEO tomorrow morning. It is not your Java that will take you there. Okay, so with that, I think I will stop and give this thing back. Thank you. Arun has given us some excellent thoughts, particularly the last one, you know, it's not just Java or C++ programming, but he just mentioned one aspect, treating people correctly. There's so many aspects which unfortunately our structured education does not teach us. And we discover to our chagrin and only too late that all the great that we have accumulated in our studies are nothing better than door openers. Okay, they, they, they make the door a little ajar, permit you to get in, but once you get into real life, the abilities like ability to solve problems, ability to have vision, ability to work hard, ability to innovate, ability to work with people in team, ability to lead, these are the things take out the marks and the knowledge does not count and I think and this is unfortunately not related to funding very heavy funding or very low funding uh, these are the aspects which those few people remember they actually become successful Raji Reddy says 25% are employable it is those 25% who not because of the education system but in spite of the structured education system they still retain the innovative spirit and spirit of inquiry and they try to they do something um, let me now request Professor Bhatt, because Professor Bhatt has been involved in this institute for a long time and he can tell us uh, from, the, from the internal side, what are the pain points? You know, this is a publicly funded elite institution. Uh, you may not call it as elite as some other institutions like my friends IIM or whatever, or some of the IITs, but believe me, the country does treat NITs as elite institutions. So, let, let's... Let's have an internal viewpoint from Prasabhat. Prasabhat. Thank you, Chairman, sir. Uh, I wish to compliment my student organizers of this event who have not only done a marvelous job in putting together a distinguished panel, but also identified a very relevant topic, framed good questions, and collected the feedback from the audience before the panel as a background for a discussion. I had the questions that were circulated, very pointed questions, four of them, 
for the feedback and uh, my response, my initial remarks are in the form of a response to these queries. From the interest of brevity, I have put it down in writing so that I don't deviate and I take very little time. I'll just read it out. The question whether taxpayers' contributions are used to support higher education, symbolized by the IAMs, IITs, NITs, etc., at the expense of primary education, appears to be a mute point. I do not have the statistics at hand to discuss the financial investment during the 10th plan and the 11th plan, etc. But what is evident is that we need to support education at all levels, primary education, middle education, as well as higher education. We need to alleviate illiteracy and also we need centers of excellence who can provide the cutting edge intellectual leadership at the global level. And the truth is that we cannot claim to be overtly successful in either. In primary education, the stark fact that stares at our face is that a su substantial section of our people is illiterate in certain parts of the country exceeding 40% of population. And even where it is otherwise, the literacy program falls short of meeting the level of education in terms of vocational training that can ease the burden of struggle for life. In the realm of higher education, we have a few institutions of repute in the international level. But the number is small in comparison with other countries of comparable standing. We may be having some 20 institutions, IAMs, IITs, IASC, and other research centers of international standing and some 220 universities across the country. Compare it with South Korea, which has 200 universities, Germany with 100 universities, UK with 125 universities. But the number is one thing and quality is another. Add to this the simple fact that the products of these centers of excellence are spread across the world. Excellence of our country spread across the world, contributing and enriching to the economy and industry of various countries. Hence the question whether the money could be utilized elsewhere with better prospects of improving the standards of living inside the country. These are questions voiced at various fora, but let me put forth my perceptions of the roots of these problems. I feel that at the base level, there are two issues. I was reading the essays by late Sri Dharampal, a very perceptive thinker and a social worker. Sri Dharampal has examined and written modestly on certain aspects of the nature of Indian society and its polity, which is certainly worth studying to find an answer to our problems. By polity, Sri Dharmapal means the political instruments and institutions, including the state, which the society projects and sustains to resolve the problem of governance. Polity is the subsidiary of the society, but often the visible representative of the latter. In his examination, Sri Dharmapal shows that the British, pre-British, that is before 1800, Indian society was far more effective in handling the problems of education as well as governance, local governance especially, by delinking and decentralizing these tasks from a centralized state-controlled activity. It is a British rule which systematically dismantled the existing village-level political setup with a view to curb local initiative and local leadership and brought both education and governance under a central grip. The game played dividends to the British. 
in less than 100 years the mechanism to generate